engaging your audience. Whenever you are speaking to a group of people, uh, one of the best strategies to keep their attention and to grab it from the beginning to the end is actually to engage them. If they feel that uh, the conversation is not a monologue, uh, but they also have a part to play, uh, they will see the need to stay focused. They will see the need to keep their eyes uh, glued to you. Um, and um, great, great speakers, great public speakers know this. Um, I, I was I was listening uh, to a politician, uh, one of the politicians in Kenya. Uh, you know, talking to a group of people, and there were many people. There were it was a crowd, and uh, what he was essentially saying was that uh, there are some cartels. There are some cartels that have been. Uh, oppressing milk farmers. So he was talking about that. And he was saying, I know there are some cartels that, uh, of course, he was taking a hit on someone specific. So he was saying, uh, the good thing with the milk cartels is that they are composed of just one person. Yeah. So it will be easier for us as the government to get rid of them. And then he goes, do you want us to get rid of these cartels? And then the crowd says, yes. Do we remove them or do we not remove them? And then the crowd says, you should remove them, you know. And, and you're like, mm, what are these guys trying to do? He's trying to make the audience feel like they are part of the conversation. Uh, and, and it's a strategy because really that, that's a that's a that's should you even ask that anyway? I mean if you know seriously speaking. So it's purely a strategy to keep the people engaged and to make them feel they're part and parcel of the conversation. When you make people feel they are part and parcel of the conversation, um, that is how we achieve that point where we said, we, we, you know, sometimes back we said that uh, this guy called uh, Bill Clinton, the former president of the US, would talk to a crowd of 10,000 people, but each person within that crowd felt like this guy is talking to him or her directly. Okay, you you're able to achieve you know that level of engagement because of the tactics, because of the strat uh, strategies that you use when you're uh, uh, up there, and 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 you can use many strategies. Um, and and uh, I'll be sharing some of them so that we see what do we do to ensure that our audience feel that they are fully involved, fully engaged in uh, the conversation. First of all, what you need to do, do not forget to uh, tell a story. Stories, in as much as some of us may feel like they are outdated, stories are very powerful. <clears throat> They're very, very powerful. And uh, storytelling is used in every culture to help with the understanding because humans like narrative structures. The reason as to why stories are so powerful is because our brains are wired from an evolutionary perspective. We are wired to appreciate stories for hundreds of thousands of years. We passed information through one community to the other or through one generation to the other through stories. If you look at uh, the amount of time that 
you know, we have been passing information in written form, it's very tiny as compared to the amount of time that we have been passing down information through stories. And therefore, our brains have evolved to appreciate stories, okay? And, and, and this is something that even uh, the, the very big brands are using today. They're using stories in their advertisement. They're using stories in their reports because people know or professionals know that when you tell a story, people get to engage uh, with that story more. You might remember that story I have just told you about the politician. You might remember it more than whatever else I'm going to say about this politician. Okay? If if you are to be told, what, what, what is the one thing that you can remember from that uh, um, lesson? You can say, Benson gave us a story or told us a story about a certain politician who did one, two, three. It's easier to remember a story than, you know, this kind of a conversation. So plan yourself in advance. Uh, is there a story that you would want to give to your audience that captures the message that you want to uh, put across? Okay. I try, for me, whenever I'm speaking, I try as much as possible to incorporate stories because in stories become very easy to, you know, captivate, uh, to captivate the audience, okay? Very, very important. Now, the other thing is ask challenging questions. Ask challenging questions. You see, when you ask a question, especially a challenging one, what do you do? You initiate some process in your audience's minds. Okay? Because our brains are wired to want to solve things. Okay? Have you ever gone to a meeting in a boardroom and somebody is speaking? Uh, but at some point, the only thing that your mind can think about is how did they get such a huge table through that door? Like your mind keeps on thinking about that. How, how did they get this table? I mean, someone is talking there, but your brain is trying to solve something. Sometimes I go to church, and then, uh, you know, the church that I usually go to, uh, the, the, the floor, uh, it's, it's uh, made of cabro, you know, cabro, and they have been put in a certain pattern. Um, and, and sometimes I catch myself looking at the floor and trying to think, is there a logical pattern in this cabros? Yeah. So, yeah, what, what, what kind of letters are they trying to <laughs> make? Because our brains are naturally set to solve things. So when you ask a question, you get people to start thinking. And every time people start thinking about something, thinking about something, they remember it more. And that is why before you provide a solution, always ask a question. Okay, always ask a question. Get something that will get, you know, make people to think, what am I going to do about this? What can I try? How am I responsible? Okay. Sometimes the question can be rhetoric, a question that doesn't require an answer. But once you ask the audience that question, they get to think, they get to remember 
uh, the point better. So ask challenging question. That way you'll get a better engagement with your uh, clients. Clarify your own interest in the topic. Tell listeners what the topic has to do with them. Okay? Focus the presentation and tell listeners what, uh, what it is about. State the importance of um, the topic. Uh, people, people look for relevance in everything that they are being taught, in everything that they are being told. They're trying to look for, for relevance. If something is not making sense to them, if something is not relevant to them, uh, they want to skip that and look for something else that is relevant to them. Same case, if, if for example, now I go through a topic that you already understand or a topic that, or, or a point that you already know, um, for some reason, for, for those 20 seconds that I'm going to spend my time there, you are likely to switch off. You're likely to switch off. Unless I present it in a way that probably you didn't expect. It. Okay? So clarify. Let people know what is in it for them. Okay? You're talking to a thousand people about... Uh, milk cartels or about taxes okay you, you must make the message resonate them you must you must make them feel <laughs> and politicians are very very good at this you must make them feel like they have a part to play there is benefit they are getting from what you're saying. If you're talking about cartels, you must make them believe that these cartels are coming for them. They're coming for you. Now, how you define you, or even how you define us, now you can choose who is us. Okay? Because obviously there is nothing like us in, in such an, uh, a, a, a situation. But you must make them believe that this message is relevant to them. Clarify your own interest in the topic. Make use of uh, nonverbal behavior. Electrify your audience. Uh, do, do not let uh, the conversation to be boring. Okay, you see, the main reason why people will start walking away, if you have a big audience and people will start walking away, it is not because you don't have content, <clears throat> but it is because you're not captivating them. I mean, <laughs> be a little dramatic. Whether in terms of your, your nonverbal behavior or uh, because of, um, you know, your words, because sometimes you can use words that are slightly contradictory, but they are meant to keep your audience glued to you. Some people usually say, uh, captivate the audience by the quality of your speech, not because of um, the, the volume of your voice. Okay? But I usually say, whichever works, use it. Whichever works, use it. And, and I would want us to learn. I would want us to learn one or two things from uh, politicians. Because politicians um, are very good at it. 
and even religious people, this whichever religion, yeah, preachers from all religions, they're very good at it, captivating your audience using your nonverbal behavior. You see someone, you know, moving up uh, and about the stage and doing some things, and you know, of course, some of these uh, nonverbal behavior can be disruptive such that we are focusing more on your theatrics than the message. But you should balance your nonverbal behavior uh, with, the with the quality of your message. Uh, because again, if you have a very high quality message, but people walk away, then uh, there's nothing you've been able to achieve. Your idea is, Keep people listening to you from the beginning to the end as much as possible and use whatever means possible. So nonverbal behavior uh, are a great way to engage your audience. Okay. And we'll be talking about uh, immediately after this, we'll be talking about how do you use, how do you manage the stage where you are? How do where do you stand? How do you walk up and down and, and those kind of things? But nonverbal uh, behavior, your gestures, your movement, your tone of voice and all those kind of things, they're very, very important. So make use of that to engage your audience. Now, direct the audience natural eye movement, okay? Guide the eye by grabbing the attention. You are supposed to be the one to decide where you want the audience to be looking at. Okay? And, and you can guide them. You can, you can, guide, you can guide the eyes of uh, your audience. And, and I want you to try this one day. You're talking to an audience, and then you stop. You look somewhere, the roof you will see all, uh, everyone in the audience, they have turned their eyes, okay? So the audience wants to focus on the most compelling information, the movement of our eyes through a composition are not random. We don't, we, 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 we don't move our eyes randomly. It's, it's very, very structured, okay? We are following something. When we are moving our eyes, we are following something, okay? We look for desired information and our attention is pulled to specific elements uh, with features obviously highlighted. We quickly skip over what is relevant, looking for meaning in what we focus on. If we look at something and we realize it's not relevant, we, we quickly get rid of it. We don't want to, to waste a lot of time there, okay? If it's attractive enough, it will grab the audience's attention, even against our intention. Sometimes you find that uh, someone might steal the show. Maybe somebody is, uh, you know, doing something within the audience, and you know everyone focuses on that direction. Okay, because that is what is attractive. So they are moving our the eye contact from where you are. So what do you do when you are on stage to ensure that people are, their eyes are fixed on you? Okay. If you, if you use, for example, your gestures uh, correctly, it captures the attention of people um, and, 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 and prevents them uh, or prevents their minds from weathering off. But if you go and start at one spot and then you're just there and you, you know, just, you know, reading your speech, people will start looking for more interesting things. They start looking for more interesting things. But even if you're standing at one spot and then you are either changing the tone the intonation of your voice 
you know, when you change the intonation of your voice and, and somebody was, you know, about to focus somewhere else, you grab them back. Okay. And you can you can do some things. For example, um, you you're talking like that, and then you say, um, hey, "James, you know, gave us an amazing example, and I want to clap for him." And then you clap your hands. And then everyone who was you know their minds was going somewhere else, they come back to you. Okay, then. Sometimes you use a, a low voice intonation. Sometimes you use, you go high like that. You use a mixture of those things here, there, here, there, here, there, here, there, so that if your speech is 30 minutes, at the end of the day, you will have ensured that those people are fixed on you uh, or they have fixed their eyes on you for all those 30 minutes. So how do you then use space in your uh, presentation the space that you have you know or the stage uh, let me call it the space um, that's a tool that you can use to grab people's attention and keep it on you for the duration of the presentation so how do you manage that how do you manage um, the space that you have state your key message from the power position Okay, your core message is the core of your talk. Choose one spot where you will stand and state your key message. It should be dead center and close to the audience. Now, um, you should you should uh, check out somebody called uh, Jim Quick. Uh, Jim Quick talks about how you can remember things. If you wanted to maybe talk about 10 points, let's assume your, 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 your speech has 10 points and you, you don't want to forget any one of them. How do you go about it? And maybe after one, uh, you, you state one point, you, you explain it for a number of minutes, then you go to the second point, you explain it a number of times, that point, a number of, you know, a, you know, a, a number of minutes explaining that kind of thing. How do you remember all the 10? And one of the things that he suggests, uh, you can check him out on YouTube, one of the things that he suggests is that if you want to remember, you can you can use time. No, no, you can use space, sorry. You can use space so that if you know where uh, you're going to be speaking from, you can say, from the center of the stage this way, I will do points one up to five. Then from the stage this way, I will do points six up to 10, okay? Use the things that are visible to, to remind you. Or you can say you are in a, in a hall. This corner will hold three points. That corner, three points. The other corner, three points. This corner, three points. So corner one, point one, two, and three. Corner two, like that, like that, like that, like that. So when you look at... You know, when you are talking to an audience and you, 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 you look like you're thinking about something and then you look at that corner and you remember, hmm, you have my three points. Then you talk, you talk, you talk, you talk, and then you look at the other corner. Hmm, that corner was holding three points. It reminds you, then another, you know, so you can use some of those things. You can use the things that you can see to remind you of the things that you cannot see. What does that mean in terms of, you know, the using of your space? It means that even for the audience, they relate your message by where you said your points. 
okay? And therefore, you don't state your core message from wherever. You don't state your core message from that corner over there. And probably during your entire conversation, during your entire presentation or speech, you will not go to that corner again. So you'll make people forget. So you can you can state your core message, you know, at the center. Okay. And then every time you want to come and emphasize that core message, come back there. Okay. Let's assume you have uh, you have decided you're going to repeat that core message four times because that is the message you want people to go home with. So every time you are mentioning that message, come to where you, to the closest place or to the most strategic position where uh, all the audience uh, can see you or something like that, okay? Then you can subdivide the other messages, you know, uh, in, in, the, in the remaining uh, parts of, of your statement. We, we relate the unknown, the unknown is your message, with the known. The known is the space that we can see. Okay? So state your key message from the power position. Uh, very, very important. Plan your structure on the stage. Again, very, very important. You don't just use the stage haphazardly. You plan how you're going to use it. Using your physical space on the stage to plan out the structure, it is going to help your audience anchor the different uh, parts of your talk. Use these areas when you do a preview near the beginning of the presentation, then return to that area of the stage for that part of the presentation. I mean, you know, so if if you're talking about point number one and you're talking about it on the left side, every time you want maybe to emphasize that, you go there. Okay. There is there is, and these are some of the tricks that you know great speakers use. And we don't know most of the times. But if you follow through, you'll be able to see there must be a reason why I I still remember uh, this message. Okay, there's a structure. There's a there's a there's a way in which it was planned. Okay, so plan your structure and start practicing now. Just start practicing, and then with time, that is going to start coming uh, naturally. Use a stage schedule where a story or an explanation involves the passage of time, imagine a timeline across the stage, okay? So if for example, you're telling people uh, something, you know, that has happened for the last five years, yeah, for the last five years. You can, you can decide, you know, how to use your, your stage. The first year, be at some you know, a, a place, a certain place, the second year, the third year, the fourth year, the fifth year. Okay? So you, you will be able to manage that stage in a way that is logical. Uh, you should read a book called The, the Power of Now. There's a book called The Power of Now. Uh, let me write The Power of Now. When you read that book, you will start realizing that I think we, we evolved, we evolved, but our minds, our brains, let me call it our brains, have not evolved yet. And uh, somebody asks us, uh, one day asked me, so who is the we? <laughs> if, if you're talking about we as a separate thing from your brain, who is we and who is the brain? 
But if you look at some of the, the tricks that your brain plays on you, for example, your brain makes you afraid of something that cannot harm you. You, you know it can't harm you. But your brain is afraid because it is still doesn't know that that thing cannot harm you. The other day I was uh, I had gone to a snake park. Yeah. And the handler of the snakes, uh, you know, picked a big snake that's harmless, it's harmless. And he put it on himself and the other people. But I knew 100% that it is harmless. But sometimes even touching it like this, before it got used, even touching it, I, I would feel, you know, sh I would shiver. And, and, and that was the work of the brain because the brain doesn't know that that thing is harmless. And therefore it is trying to protect you until you tell your brain and you teach it that this thing is harmless. Okay? So, our brains have been left behind a little bit. As, as we are advancing, our brains have been left behind a little bit. Uh, the primary function of a brain is to make you survive not to make you grow. The primary function for the brain is survival, not growth. And that is why uh, people take comfort in familiarity. The brain is very comfortable in something that is familiar. People fear change. Because the brain has learned to associate change with danger. Okay, and that's why when we are we are training people on, on self-growth and that kind of thing, you know, you, we must recondition our brains to, to start uh, considering change as safe. What do I mean? What I mean is when we are talking to our audience we should know that they are processing information using a brain that sometimes is irrational. Okay? Sometimes it's irrational. And that is why things, some of the things that we are talking about, like stage management, how you manage the stage, in order to get people to remember things, we might think that hmm, that doesn't sound, you know, very progressive. But neither do our brains. Our brains are not very progressive. You know, like what I'm talking about, uh, uh, doing physical things to remind you of, like, like you know, looking at a certain corner and knowing I have placed my three points there. In another corner, I have placed another three points there. It is because our brains have evolved to identify patterns. Okay? We have evolved to know that this area, there are usually tigers. This area, uh, there are some poisonous trees. And, and that is what made us survive. So our brains are very good at identifying and remembering patterns, okay? So when we are talking about stage management, again, it becomes very, very important for us to appreciate that, that we are talking to people, even us, who are, whose brains are still uh, thinking in terms of patterns. Very, very important. Another thing, discuss the costs and benefits as if you were in an argument. Again, very, very important. Um, in a debate, uh, the people argue each side will stand at different sides of the stage. 
adapt this strategy, stand on one side for the costs and the other side for benefits. Let's assume you are, you know, trying to tell people, you know, these are the benefits of this uh, uh, investment, for example, and these are the costs for this investment. Okay. Again, you can manage your stage so that one of the on 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 the the side of uh, maybe the benefits, you are on one side. On the side of uh, the costs, you are on another side. Again, that helps people to remember. Remember, we are saying that people, our brains identify patterns, and if we can find a pattern. Uh, in the in our presentations, then uh, our audience is going to resonate and remember our message uh, much better. Provide each preference its own spot. Again, I think this is something that we have now agreed on. Stand in a specific spot for each option that you describe. Okay? When you refer back to an option later in your presentation, you can go back to that spot. Again, I think that is something that uh, we've talked about move close for highlights again if you have a very important point that you want your audience to really grasp get closer to them okay get closer to them if for example you are talking uh, uh your stage is raised a little bit and there's something that you really want to emphasize you can calm down and and get close to the audience all right, so moving uh, close to the people is powerful. Sometimes it can be intimidating, yeah, could be intimidating, but you can get close to somebody and then look somewhere else. You're going to catch their attention without intimidating them. I remember when uh, I used to teach in high school, many years ago, I used to, to be a high school teacher, and I, I would do that. You see a student is not concentrating, you go where they are, you, you, you hold their desk, you lean on it, okay, using your hand, but you are looking at the whiteboard or the blackboard or, you know, the front, or you're looking at another part of the classroom. This person is going to, the attention is going to come up, but they're not going to feel intimidated, okay? So if you want to highlight something, move closer to your audience. Rev with your slides. Now, if you're using slides, if you're using slides, like the way I am using slides, place the data, uh, the data show screen, slightly off uh, to the side uh, to keep as much flexibility as possible. If the screen is in the middle, um, it is easy to turn into a projectionist instead of a presenter. And, and, and we are going to be talking about how do we how do we prepare slides that really captivate uh, your audience? Okay. How do you prepare powerful slides? If it is to the side, then you can still claim the power um, position. Stick some duct on the floor as a reminder to avoid stepping into the beam of the data show. Now, some, I see some people, you, you have a presentation uh, it's a PowerPoint presentation. You have uh, your projector, but you keep interrupting. You know, even the audience are telling you, move a little bit. We want to see. Because you're carried away by the message uh, such that you you block, you know, people's views. Do not let your PPTs, do not let your PowerPoint presentations, do not let your, even if it's a Word document you're presenting, do not let it steal your show. It's still your message, not the PPT's message. The PPT is just a tool. It is not the speech. Okay. The same case with the, like for us, whenever we are training, this is just a guide. It is, this is not the training. All right. This is an, a training aid. It is not the training, it's a training aid. 
So the same case with you, do not let your uh, presentations uh, or projections uh, steal your show. And finally, I want to talk about how do you design effective slides? How do you design effective slides? I'll be done in a few minutes. Uh, most of the times, or maybe a number of times, you will be required to use slides to deliver a speech. Okay, you'll be required to use some slides to deliver a speech. The biggest challenge I have seen is people trying to create slides, but they create notes instead. This is the difference between notes and slides. In fact, slides should not be self-explanatory. If they're self-explanatory, they're not slides. You should put minimal information in your slides. Why is it called a PowerPoint presentation? <clears throat> PowerPoint, power, point. First of all is because your presentation should be in point form. That's number one. That's why it is a PowerPoint. Should be in point, uh, point, point form. But then you also don't include every point in your PowerPoint. You, you pick the points that are powerful, okay? That's why there must be power in every point. If there is no power in that point, strike it out. Leave the only that point that has, you can, you can have a different guide, you know, to show you how to explain that point. But PowerPoint presentations are supposed to be very, very brief and straight to the point. So keep it simple. I mean, this is um, the first rule. If your slides are more important than what you're saying, then your message will lose impact. Okay? If I have, if I put more points here than the ones that I'm telling you, then you don't need me. You only need the slides, okay? Your slides must be accompaniment or an accompaniment and not distract from your words. Okay, and I think we've talked about that. This is just an aid. It doesn't, or it's not supposed to steal the show. Avoid slides with a lot of texts, especially if it's just a repetition of what you're saying. Okay, if you need text heavy slides, then slowly reveal uh, the text when needed. There's a way you can set your slides in such a way that you know text uh, come after the other you explain this then you reveal the other one like that like that like that include the main speaking points in form of short and concise bullets or bullet points on your slide so keep it simple very very simple indeed now choose your slides ratio now what is slides ratio slides ratio is what would I say? How would I say? Like this is a. Uh, it looks like a square, isn't it? This looks like a square. You can have another one that looks like a, a rectangle, so that it is longer, but shorter. Okay, so again, depending on the nature of your presentation, choose your the correct uh, slides uh, ratio. Have a noticeable title page. Again, the title page, very, very important. Uh, so you see, for example, what we are talking about here, this one, design effective uh, presentation slides. It's, it's easy to remember. It's there, it's clear, it's noticeable, okay? 
So create a visually engaging title page so that the audience is interested and ready to listen before you begin speaking, okay? The title page and reverse title page are necessary for every presentation. All other elements of the front matter are used only if they are relevant to your presentation, okay? So ensure as, as, you, as you present the introduction to your message, you know, the, the title page that you have projected there is captivating enough. People want to really learn more about your message. Limit changes and animations. Sometimes people have so, so many animations. There's so many. Uh, uh, you see texts coming in, dancing. Yeah. You see others are, it's like, it's a cutting being opened like this. If you play around with the uh, PowerPoint presentations, you will see all those. Now, sometimes they are disruptive. People get more fascinated by the theatrics of your animations than the message itself, okay? So limit those changes and animations. Use graphic supports. Um, if you can get some very nice um, photos or some very nice drawings or some something visual, something visually appealing, okay? You can put it there. Especially when you're talking to um, a large crowd, because when, imagine you're talking to a hundred people, they can't read these, uh, these texts. At least for you, you can be able to read, but a hundred people, this, Nobody, that is why if you look at uh, many billboards, uh, you, you're driving and you see a billboard. If it doesn't have an image, you are more likely to not even look at it. Yeah. I, I saw one restaurant uh, advertising on, uh, on a billboard. And then they had this photo of a very juicy uh, burger. You see this, this hamburger, very nice and it looked yummy. And then they see the caption, uh, the caption there, they were saying, uh, don't eat the billboard. We are right ahead. Yeah. Uh, well, they, they could see somebody might want to eat <laughs> the billboard because it's a very nice photo. Don't eat the billboard. We are right ahead. So come, we have the real burger. So sometimes you can use the, uh, you know, images. They, they work very well. Uh, they work very, very well when it comes to uh, talking to a large group of people. Use high quality graphics, okay? If you want your presentation slides to look professional, then you need to use high quality graphics. Our main points can be illustrated with images, but these images shouldn't be a sketched low resolution photo as it will look sloppy. Again, uh, whenever you're coming up with these graphics, ensure they look good, ensure they are clear, ensure they have good resolution, okay? They shouldn't be faded. They shouldn't be cliche. You know, the, the image that you see, everyone has seen that image anyway. So, yeah. So again, ensure whatever images that you're using are of high quality. Presentation slides come last. Design your presentation, uh, presentation slides after deciding on your message and your supporting evidence, okay? So when you're doing your, when you're preparing your speech, write it down somewhere, okay? You can even type it on a Word document. Read it, rehearse it, extract the main points, understand it, internalize it. And then and only then should you design 
your presentation slides. Okay? Because then your presentation slides will contain that which comes from your heart, not from the notes that you have prepared. Okay? Remember that the slides enhance the experience, but the actual speech needs to stand out on its own. And I think we have talked about that. Do not let the slides uh, steal your show. So as a, as, a, as, a, as a professional public speaker, it is very, very important to design approaches that will captivate your audience, okay? Including the use of your, you know, body language, including the use of the stage, including, you know, how compelling your PowerPoint presentations are, but whatever it is that you do, ensure you're doing whatever possible um, to keep your audience fully engaged.